Tim Topham, you're back on the podcast. I'm back. Yay. Thanks for having me back, Carly. <laughs> Great to see you. If this is a yearly thing, I, and I hope it continues. <laughs> Absolutely. We should do it more often, really, but it's always fun. So, and congratulations on your podcast and all the great things you're doing at TMO. It's fantastic there to see all the great things you're up to. And I'm an avid listener of your show as well. So great to hear and oh. great to be on the show. Thank you so much. That's so, so nice to hear. I was thrilled to hear that you have written a book and I feel like it's been a long time coming with <laughs> this topic that you are so adamant about and have been really truly teaching and promoting since I've known you. Um, so introduce your book to us and tell us what the premise of this endeavor was. Sure. The look, it's it's really quite simple. The, the name of the book is No Book Beginners. And the premise of the book is that I make an argument for why teaching reading to a piano student is not the best thing to do in their first few lessons. And so the book goes into some of the history of why we've got to this point where the first thing we do do is try and teach reading in those first lessons. Uh, and I explain what that what some of the outcomes of that is. And then the second half of the book goes into detail about what other things we could do and why teachers should consider doing them and the kinds of outcomes that they can get from doing that. Amazing. As I was reading through several parts of this book, I thought there are so many teachers who will be hesitant, um, which you have coached hundreds of teachers, thousands through this process of accepting <laughs> that we don't need method books. Um, we don't need to rely on method books. I think right. that's more, maybe more accurate. Method books have a fantastic place. Mm. And I have been guilty of falling back on them way too many times. So what? how do you start with a teacher who has that hesitancy to put the book on the shelf and just be with their student? Yeah, great question. And I should say I've got nothing against method books. They are, as you say, they have a, p p a fantastic place and they are the best way to teach a student to read music. That is their purpose and they do it absolutely brilliantly. My argument is just that there are many more things that we can do in those first few lessons to engage and inspire, to bring out the mm. curiosity of our students, to bring out their imagination, to engage with them in music, but also to have an opportunity to explore some of those musicality kinds of skills that we often don't do until later, like singing and chanting mm -hmm. and pitch matching and playing by ears and clapping and rhythm exercises and all of these things that we know are fundamentally important, but often we don't just simply don't do them or we do them later on. And my argument is why? Because you can have these amazing experiences with children in their first few lessons if you've got a structure, and we'll talk about that in just a sec, um, that is both creative, but also really deeply musical. And mm -hmm. what we've had, what we've seen from the teachers who've used this in their teaching is that they're finding that the skills their students have and are developing and showing a couple of years down the track are really different to those who don't have this experience at the start. So to answer your actual question, which was about how do you actually dive in when this is new, I'm really conscious of this. And I was in that yeah. same position. And I tell the story in the book about the first child, Josh, who I actually just found a picture of the other day, which is very cool, who, <laughs> uh, who went through this program for the first time after I'd been developing it and testing bits and pieces and everything. He was the first kid I put through. But even for me, someone who is quite comfortable off the page. It was a bit nerve wracking. You know, am I doing the right things? How's this going to work? Is this going to be sequenced together? Is he going to understand? Is he going to enjoy it? So I do talk a lot about this in the book. Uh, and the short answer is that the book steps you through yeah. a complete process, step by step, hand holding all the way, literally telling you what to say and do and giving you all the resources you need that anyone can do it. And there's also um, a chapter in there or a section in there about what if I'm not creative, because I do hear that from a lot of teachers who've had, who've sadly kind of had the creativity, not beaten out of them, but they just, it's just kind of gone by the wayside because of the nature of the classical traditional lesson. Uh, and they're feeling like, oh, how could I possibly do this? I'm not creative. And I speak to that in the book too. And I give examples and testimonials from teachers who said exactly the same thing. 
and who had huge success with it and then went mm. on and took some of my ideas, which I thoroughly encourage, took some of the ideas and made them their own and built on them mm. and added more stories and more activities and they've never looked back. I was thinking as you were talking that it's just so empowering to provide a teacher with those tools to then go and be creative on their own. I loved the visual in the book of the iceberg and kind of the, <laughs> the, the idea of the tip of the iceberg being what, what we think or what we might be teaching during a lesson, like the traditional rhythm counting like notes on the page, which actually is a lot of work to, to teach, you know, to share, it's to coach. Hard work. Mm. It is. But then beneath the surface, like there's a myriad of other, subjects and things. And I, I'm just wondering why are we so hesitant to go there with students? Is it because we think we need to go get a method book that, that is like written out? I don't know. <laughs> it's, I talk about some of the history and my thinking on this towards the front of the book. And, you know, if we go back to Bach, all of those perform, all of those famous people we know from that era, the Purcells and all of those guys who were all guys at that time, of course, were all improvisers and creators and composers. That was their job. You couldn't get work as a musician in that period of history if you weren't making mm -hmm. music. And that's why we have fireworks music and Canon in D and all those amazing things. Over time, as printing came out and recording and things like that, we had a gr huge growth in people playing the music of other people and so we, we've we've kind of changed from this creator paradigm as our good late friend forrest kinney called it creator paradigm to a performer paradigm where we're more akin to shakespearean actors than musical creators and with that then came well if everyone wants to perform the music of the masters we need to teach them how to actually read the music of the masters so let's create method books and then there's this explosion in method books and then we all were brought up with that uh, you were probably taught that way. I was taught that way. Most people mm -hmm. our age and older certainly were taught that way. And because few of us have pedagogy training that's sort of modern and innovative and things like that, we tend to teach how we were taught. And so this has just sort of been the way it's always been done. And I really want to put a, a flag in the sand and say, hang on, is this, let's, have, let's just think about this. Let's just stop and think for a second. Is this the best way? And I would conclusively say no. And I hope that people who read the book will agree with that in the end and then give this an alternative a try. What are some of the results you've seen? You know, you mentioned you just connected with a student you started teaching this method to years ago. And how, what is the result with the difference, I guess, that you've seen in your own? Yeah, well, there's some, yeah. some, some key things that I think teachers will resonate with as I go through them now and go, ah, oh, yeah, that is a trouble. That is a problem. So one of the things that a lot of us struggle with is getting our kids to sing, particularly piano students. We all know that singing is great. It, it increases our ability to shape phrases and understand music and all of these things. It's great. We need to be singers, but we often don't sing. And I think it's easy for us as teachers to get frustrated, particularly over here in Australia, when suddenly they're doing an exam and they've got to do an oral test and the student can't do it and they're terrified of singing and they can't actually hear something on an instrument and match the pitch and sing it back or whatever it is all of these these things can be built from those first lessons so in answer to your question one of the things that we can normalize by doing it right from the start and continuing to do it all the way through is singing and getting students comfortable doing that and singing what they hear and having you play something and they hum it back or vice versa if you can incorporate these skills at the start, then it becomes much more normalized. And so if you did want to teach a student to play something by ear later on, you're not starting from scratch. They've already had this experience over the course of a period of time. Another thing that students will sometimes struggle with is feeling meter and pulse, particularly the difference between let's say three, four and four, four. And so I'm sure you perhaps Carly have had a student who's been playing something in three, four, and then just mysteriously added a beat and had a 4-4 bar and kind of glossed over it and not really realized. And to us, we're like, oh, hang on, no, this is in 3-4. Why aren't you feeling that pulse? Again, mm -hmm. one of those things that we can do in those first lessons and one of the things that is in these lesson plans is feeling and moving to a steady pulse, clapping beats, the difference between rhythm and pulse. 
Uh, and I think all, you know, all of these are fundamental musical skills that are just unfortunately neglected, but so important later on, if we want them to be able to play in time, understand patterns, play by ear, be able to feel comfort in improvising. You know, some, one of the reasons that adults really struggle to improvise is because they're terrified of making mistakes because of their lessons that they had as a child. We want to make that a normal, <laughs> normal factor, right? And so improvising the is a embarrassment. big part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Well, and I'm thinking of all the, you know, boys or girls, students, you know, who hit that like nine, 10, 11 age and are just zero interest um, anymore. And hopefully this is a method that supersedes the like the boredom um which i know you mentioned in the book is the the boredom that mm. uh kids kids tend to face and i think we as teachers have become used to it and we're we just can oh convince the parent like just keep them in just keep them in it'll which it does pass but is there a better way so they're not bored so that they come home like you also mentioned in the book like excited about the art project they come home excited about you know, this new piece or this new song or this something they heard or something they sang and instead of the like dragging their feet. Mm. Well, I think this, this speaks to one of our top music pillars, which is a student first approach. And you mentioned that age like 11 to 14 is critical for students. If they're going to continue playing, then they need to start identifying as a musician during those years. And we believe strongly in a student first approach, which is to say that the student needs to have autonomy and there is great power in autonomy. And there's lots of research about self-determination theory that giving students autonomy in what they're doing is a self-motivating factor. So if we're always just dictating, this is what you do, turn the page, this piece, blah, 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 and never give them that opportunity to have a say in what they do, then they are, it's a fact they're more likely to quit and more likely now to quit than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. So giving them that opportunity to do some of the things that they want to do is really, really important. And I would say that in addition to what we're saying, we're talking about with this no book beginners in that period, 11 to 14, make sure you're teaching them some hooks of pop songs, some chord progressions, some things that they can use to show off to their friends and family so that those friends and family go, oh, Carly, you're such a cool piano player. You've got to play some more. And then Carly starts going, oh, yeah, maybe I am. A, I'm, a, I'm a piano player. Well, that's cool. And I'm not going to quit piano if I'm a piano player. That's what we want, right? Mm. Yeah, we want them to have to be embracing this identity. I think mm. what an amazing gift to give a student who is going through hard years, you know, and mm. going going through school and who knows the, the many challenges between home life and school life that um that that our students face and we already know the importance of mentorship but but being able to give them like this is this is something you can be excited about and share and show and what a great hook for them to keep coming back right <laughs> exactly right yes yeah it's those it's those little things and it's it's important too that there's a balance that we have to walk a fine line if you do take a student first or a student-centered approach then the amount of student-centeredness will vary depending on their age but will mm -hmm. necessarily only be a part of what you do but now whether that's 50 50 their choice your choice or it's 20 percent their choice and 80 percent yours will depend on their age and their interests and yeah. their goals particularly so it does vary a bit but Yes, the more the more one number one skills we can give them that that have those below the iceberg skills embedded in them from a young age is great. And secondly, the autonomy that we can give them will have an impact later on and does. Right. And I, I want to tie in the benefit of marketing as well. The, the benefit of teaching this way is the marketing that will happen for your studio naturally. Um, and I, I know you teach this, that the, the more value, the better you are as a teacher, the more people that come knocking on your door. And like that is the best promoter of a studio is, is teaching in a way that people come back and they talk about it. Mm. And there's lots of little testimonials throughout the book from teachers saying what the parents of their mm -hmm. students have said to them about, wow, I've never seen so much practice. 
holy moly, how did you learn to teach like this? And really, we're not doing mind blowing things. These are relatively simple. It's just so different to what the parents out there have also experienced. So yeah, you're right. It's it's a fantastic marketing opportunity. It's also a great retention strategy too, because mm. if you do teach successfully in this more holistic way, your students will tend, if you do it right, to stick around longer without you having to worry so much about it. And students who stick around longer tend to tell more people about it too. So yeah, the the, the marketing aspect of this is a great opportunity for 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 um uh, teachers that but i would just say one thing that you do have to consider is how to explain this to parents because if they went through the traditional method book mm -hmm. exams or whatever it is system they may go uh, hang on what's carly is this this is weird what's going on here <laughs> so i do speak to that in the book as well uh and there was there's a great quote in there from elisa milne which i uh shared in regard to anybody who kind of questions whether this is actually the right thing to do for your students um she says i'll, I'll quote her now she said um if parents find this strange this wet method of teaching Tell them that it's much more important that you explore rhythm, pulse, creativity, and improvisation before they start reading. I've never had a parent anything but thrilled to see their child exploring lots of sound on the piano, using all the keys and pedals and having a ball. It's so good. It's so good. What great, what great feedback. Like you don't want any more, any better <laughs> right. <laughs> feedback than that. Okay, so teachers listening are now thinking, Okay, I know the answer to my board students. Where do I start? And you have shared so much in the book about where to start. So just give us a little sneak peek into what, what teachers can expect on how they can actually apply this. Great. So I will say up front as well, we have the lesson plans in the book, which are literally, here's the objective of the lesson, here's what you say, here are the different sections, here's what you do. We also have a companion website where you can see videos of me at the piano teaching this stuff to you. So you can see what's actually going on because that makes things much easier to understand. The other thing that we give you is practice plans. So, or play what I like to call play plans because it's always better to talk to these kids about playing the piano rather than practice. You, you might do this yourself, Carly. Uh, practice is obviously hard and boring. Play is fun and easy. So let's get them to play during the week. But one of the things that teachers often ask is, well, if there's no book, what are they going to do when they're at home? And so we actually specify here are the activities to go on with and we give you backing tracks so they can keep improvising. We give you strategies to continue the curios curiosity and in, in imagination sort of activities that we've, we've built in. So to give you just a quick outline of perhaps just that first lesson and how that would actually look in the book, we uh, start the lesson, obviously welcoming the child in, getting very excited, asking them about their day and what they've been doing and all that kind of stuff. And then we simply ask them, what would you like to play? And I haven't really had a child yet not keen to play something with a little bit of encouragement. And so what I encourage teachers to do then is to play along, uh, add a drum beat, play on a second instrument, change the sound to a string patch, it doesn't matter if it's Mary Had a Little Lamb or the first few notes of Fur Elise that you cannot stand or Chopsticks, whatever it is, get in there, be excited, get engaged. If you can play along with some chords or something, do that and show them how passionate and excited you are for the music that they want to learn. It's just a great inroad into just making that connection and building rapport, but also it gives you the chance to hear, see what they're like. How are they sitting at the piano? How are they engaging with the instrument are they listening to themselves are they playing in time with you if you put a beat on can they keep in time so it's actually a really useful activity for diagnosing where they're at so that's the intro first activity then we move on to uh oh a simple activity about technique which is just getting the sitting height right i don't worry too much carly in these first lessons about the perfect hand shape and drop float and lift and wrist movements all those kind of things we just want to get them engaged and connected to the music but i do think sitting at the right height is important so we have some games and activities around that and they get to teach their parents how to sit at the piano that night and you can slouch the next time and they can try and fix up your posture and all those kinds of things so that's fun and then we're into some black key improvs 
And I give you a number of different styles with accompaniments that you can play on another instrument or a duet on your piano. And there's also fully orchestrated backing tracks that you can play along with. And we give you some ideas of what sets of keys you can use, two notes, three, three keys, all the black notes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, mm. And then I think we finish the lesson with what I call an animal improvisation, which is to say we uh, show the child how different areas of the piano can potentially be related to different animals in the world. Uh, so up high can be ants or bees or something and down low might be rhinoceroses and elf elephants or whatever. And can they make up a story using the whole range of the piano and the pedal that could explain something that's going on between these animals? Uh, and they then get to make up a new story that night uh, and then play it back to you, start a lesson two, and you have to try and work out what the story is and who the animals are. It's super fun. And really, it's all quite easy. And I hope teachers listening can will be going, maybe I can do this because everybody can do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's great. Well, thank you for giving that outline and, and helping us understand what we can expect. Because I think before hearing that, it sounds like, gosh, do I have to be, you know, uh, have perfect pitch or, <laughs> mm, or a composer or know my jazz chords. Right. Yeah. Right. Or know my jazz yeah. chords. Right. Like yeah. I didn't learn my jazz chords until I got to Berkeley. Like, you yeah. know, there's, there are, there are just, the, there's so much as teachers that we feel like we are lacking. And so I think when anyone asks us to be creative and step away from a method book, the, the things that come up in our minds are like, gosh, I haven't improvised in myself in, you know, mm. how many, how long, or like, I haven't written a song or I haven't been taught by another teacher how to do X, Y, and Z in this long. And, and I, I, so I think hearing that is really helpful because it means it doesn't matter. And we are all so creative. I think of my daughters who are currently ages five and six and they make up songs the mm. silliest songs <laughs> all the time to the point where Mike and I, my husband just go, okay, I think that that, that song is done. I think it is, it's done now. <laughs> I mean, about the toilet and about getting <laughs> dressed and about playing in the sun. And I mean, we ski here and they'll sing songs on the chairlift. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking, gosh, I need to pull that creativity into when we are sitting down so I can teach them my favorite instrument, I need to be bringing that in and bringing that back and say, you know, we were on the chairlift, like let's find that song mm. on the piano and put the method books aside, like think outside the box teachers and, and trust your instinct, I feel like, and stop thinking, like no one's watching, there's no like, music cop who's in there <laughs> with a clipboard <laughs> like wait you didn't teach a middle c carly like shame yeah. shame 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 on no. you <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that's that's beautifully said and kids love particularly and this noble beginners is is designed really for ages 6 to 10 11 ish if that's the perfect age range and kids that age as you say they and i know your your daughters are younger than that but even kids at that age love being silly and making things up and you know you can capture them before their imagination gets drowned out by their teenage hormones let's <laughs> let's use it <laughs> and have fun with it and i should say to the the framework while i give you uh anything up to 10 weeks worth of no book activities that you can do you're welcome to use this completely as you wish so if you want to do just try one activity with one student on the side of a method book, just to dip your toe in the water. That's totally fine. If you want to just do the first three weeks with a student or just try one activity, there's a, there's a great activity called around the world improv that goes over three or four weeks. If you just want to take that out and use that, that is totally fine. I am not precious about these ideas. I want teachers to use them as will fit into their, the way they teach already, I guess. I would just say, yeah, introduce that reading along the side so you can run the two things along. And then eventually, hopefully, some of the things that you've learned in, no, in the notebook approach, you'll be able to more naturally just bring into lessons with your students later on as well. Oh, absolutely. I think once they get into a rhythm of breaking those walls down and saying, oh, I, I don't have to do what I was taught or the method I was taught, that teachers should expect to be surprised at how many ideas they have. 
That mm. is the consensus I hear when teachers try out something different, a unique approach. It, it's exciting. It's rejuvenating. It's refreshing to have a new way to help te help your students spark their imagination. Whenever we have a student who is suddenly excited, unlike they were before, it's refreshing, right? Like, oh yeah, like this is exciting. This isn't just yeah. another student coming through the door. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a buzz. And I've heard that from many teachers who were just feeling a bit flat and mm -hmm. bored, to be honest, with how they were approaching new students. And as fun as they were trying to make it with their personality and things, it just wasn't enjoyable that much anymore. And I've, I've just heard time and time again, you know, thank you for allowing me, giving me permission to, yeah. to do some of this fun stuff that I've kind of thought about, or I didn't think was right or whatever it is. And I, I just hope that not only will teachers see, yeah, this is fun and students absolutely love it. And so do parents. It's also got meaning and there's pedagogical, a pedagogical basis to all these yeah. activities that will build in time. Oh, so great. Well, Tim Topham, thank you so much. No book beginners, teachers, what a contribution you've given our community. It's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing and giving us a sneak peek. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on the show. Can I tell people where they can find out more? Yes, please. <laughs> Fantastic. It's over at topmusic.co slash book. And there is an opportunity to get the PDF as a download if you'd like. Uh, we also will have print. I'm not sure exactly when this podcast episode is going out, but we'll have links there to the print book if you'd prefer that. And I've also just finished recording the audio book. So that is another way that people can consume it if they want. Topmusic.co slash book. Amazing. And I will link everything in the show notes and teachers who are on our email list, they will get the links. So we will make sure they know where to find that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tim. No worries. I should just say one other thing, and that as I know that a lot of your teachers are online teachers, and we've had a lot of online teachers use the concepts in this book. So while it is most definitely written with an in-person perspective, uh, and there, there will be some activities that aren't possible to do. There's a game called Frog and Snake, which I'd be fascinated, Carly, if you can work out how to do that <laughs> online. I don't think it's possible, but 80% of everything else can 100% be done online as well. It's so funny. I didn't even bring it up because at this point, I have assumed that everything we can teach in person can be done online, right? Yeah. Like yeah. with a few exceptions. But thank you so yeah, much some for of those mentioning games. that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. There are things yeah. there are things that sometimes you can't do in online. I, I mean, I am excited for our teachers to try this because it is it causes you to have to really um, direct your students in a different way. And it's, it's more hands off when you're online and you're in front of a screen, but I'm really excited for our online teachers to try it as well. Me too. And really happy to answer questions and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, look me up if you need any guidance and I'd love to hear from your teachers as to how it goes. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me, Carly. See ya.